Welcome. I'm Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm a hematologist oncologist, and I'm associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. In my professional life, I see patients, I teach trainees, and I do research in healthcare policy. This is Plenary Session. Plenary Session is a podcast at the intersection of medicine, oncology, and health policy, and you're listening to season three. On this week's episode. This week on Plenary Session, I'm joined by Jacob Hale Russell. He's a professor of law at Rutgers Law School, and he is the author of a forthcoming book that's going to be about skepticism, elites, and expertise. Here, we take a deep dive into COVID-19, and we talk about how science ought to be debated in the era of trade-offs. You won't want to miss this discussion. If you like this podcast and want more content, follow me on Twitter at vprasadmdmph. Check out the YouTube channel, Vinay Prasad, MDMPH. Patreon backers will get access to the slides for lectures I give on Plenary Session. Want to hear from us? Email us your question at plenary session podcast at gmail.com. So I'm back in plenary session, joined via Zoom by Jacob Russell. Jacob Hale Russell is an associate professor of law at Rutgers University, and he, with a colleague, Dennis Patterson, are the authors of a very interesting first opinion that came out just just on the eve of Christmas Eve. It's entitled, Let's Put the Straw Man of Pandemic Denial Out of Its Misery. And I guess we're going to explore the themes of this and probably beyond um, in this discussion. Um, Professor Russell, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks. Likewise. Happy to be here. Really. I've enjoyed your coverage of, of COVID since the beginning of it and since before that. So. Oh, really? Oh, here. thank you so much. Um, you never know because um, uh, uh, there's a lot of people who, who would disagree with your opinion. <laughs> well, it is it is interesting to see. I think a lot of the things you study are, I think, track other fields, right? So a lot of the questions and skepticism you have about incentives on research, I think there are a lot of parallels in in law and social sciences. So that's that's how I got interested in it, and I, I see a lot of a lot of similarities. Not always for the not always for the good. Yes, yes, we're both concerned with the same things in many cases. Um, so I found your, um, you know, um, I, I think you you knew I would find it really interesting because um, you know you, you you we connected right after you had written it, um, and I so I found your op-ed just riveting and fascinating. I think you know you're putting your finger exactly on what um, a lot of things I've been feeling but struggling to articulate. Um, so I wonder if we might unpack it a little bit. Um, I guess I guess we want to say a few things. Um, you know, you're somebody who believes that for complex policy interventions, it is. This is something I I noticed the other day on on Twitter. Somebody said um, I, the greatest shock of COVID nineteen to me was the professors at Stanford, Harvard, and Oxford would disagree with the canonical thinking, and I thought to myself. For a second, I was like, oh, that is a surprise. No, wait a second. If you do something that's a massively ambitious policy that's never, ever been done in the history of humankind, when you're facing a threat that's unprecedented, that hasn't occurred in 100 years, it is inevitable that people at Harvard, Stanford, and Oxford, some of them, not all of them, but some of them will have different views. That's not a surprise. It's an inevitability. So I wonder if you might start with that about, you know, you're somebody who thinks about complex policy. What's your background? How did you first approach this question? Yeah, I mean, all of those themes have been, I think, a longstanding interest of mine. And I think, you know, the, the pandemic has laid bare a set of ways in which we think about expertise as a society in all kinds of problematic ways. So we misuse expertise. We, uh, you know, we fall into these camps where we're, we're in favor of expertise or against expertise, neither of which is particularly helpful, where we, <laughs> you know, think that all questions can be settled simply by resort to expertise. And, you know, those were, I think, already um, themes for me in, in, in research I had been doing into law. And it's been interesting to see some parallel arguments in past discussions I've had about law that have sort of come up in the mm -hmm. scientific context in, in COVID. Um, but I guess the way we got into this piece with my colleague, Dennis Patterson, we were um, we taught a course back in the spring on populism. And one of the things we were trying to do, um, you know, I think we both come from, a, I'll put my cards out, we both come from a sort of liberal, um, in my case, I think, um, you know, pretty progressive uh, political stance, but we were both very interested in understanding and sort of um, really not just turning populist voters into a, a straw man character, but really mm -hmm. understanding what motivates them to make choices, understanding what maybe connects a left leaning populist voter and a right leaning populist voter to people who have very different policies, but maybe have similar stances towards um, towards elites and expertise. Mm. And the, you know, the theme that we started to hone in on was, uh, you know, the sort of populist critique of 
and, and by populist, we really mean the voters, critique of, of expertise. And um, we really came to understand that a lot of what I think th that that comes out in sort of populist uprisings comes from a real rational core. It's a real rational, not necessarily right, not necessarily that I agree with it, but rational in the sense that um, they see a gap in the way experts or expertise or expertise is presented to them and what they're actually seeing in the real world. And, and that critique is sort of a valid, grounded critique. It's a, it's a kind of skepticism that... Um, you know, that actually is based on sort of a good faith set of views mm -hmm. and that probably the most helpful way if you're sort of concerned about populism or if you want to engage populism is really to engage that, not to just dismiss populist voters or to label them as Luddites or to label them as anti-experts or label them as science deniers. So we'd already started that project and then, um, you know, the pandemic came along and like many others in uh, March, I read um, John Eunides' is, uh uh, now infamous piece in, in stat. And he was someone who I'd, um, you know, followed uh, and respected for a long time. And I think what- Not anymore. Um, not anymore. <laughs> and <laughs> no. respect him. In, right. I, I can't say what I, now yeah. I can't tell you what no, I think you, of him anymore. You, you mean you always, um, you always knew he was a son of a bitch is what you mean. <laughs> ex exactly. Right. It laid bare what we yeah, all knew all along. Well, I mean, that was what was interesting to me was how quickly- yeah comments sort of, you know, the, the forget whether you agree or disagree with sure. his piece, which I think, you know, yes. you've talked about it before, it got turned into a character. Yeah. So many of the responses sort of resorted to that level of, of name calling. <laughs> and it was really remarkable and sort of disappointing to see kind of, you know, very respected names engaging in yeah. name calling and saying your entire career has been a, a sham. You know, <laughs> yeah. he's always been a mediocrity. <laughs> You're thinking some of these are people who and go back and find where they praised him or excited yeah, him yeah. two years earlier yeah. and now are, are yeah, trashing yeah. him personally. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess I originally chalked it up. You know, my thought was, well, this is early on and people are very emotional and it's stressed. It's the heat of the moment. Heat of the moment. Thing, and yeah. so people will get over it. Yeah. And I think, you know, you and Jeff, I think, had it right that this was, you know, more of a, this was not a one-off fluke. This was really a serious issue in the in the tenor of of conversations and so since then um dennis and i have really been tracking and kind of documenting we have another piece that should come out later this month um you know documenting what we see as sort of problems in the structure of the debate around the pandemic so it's not that we're we're not saying you're not taking sides X policy yeah. or y policy it's that we think the structure of the conversation is badly warped and it's warped in a way that reflects i think things we see it's not just a problem of sciences or a problem of the pandemic it's a broader problem of the way we treat and and sort of mistreat expertise in in contemporary policy making. Yeah, that's um I, I think you're putting your finger on exactly exactly the, the my sore spot throughout all of this, which is that uh, even more important to me than the specific policy debates on all the specific issues which we can run through um, is the fact that we need to have some arena left in this world where people who agree to using reason and logic and data and facts can engage substantively on these issues. And if we we're going to say there's no such arena, the academy is no longer that arena, that's not the space for that, um, there's no space for that. Uh, then I think we 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 are in a terrible position, not just for this pandemic, but for whatever future disaster may befall us that may not be a virus, but anything that requires a scientific coordinated global response. We're fucked because we have no space to talk about these issues. Um, and, and that to me is a is an existential threat um, and a threat to, I guess, something that you and I unspoken, but we believe in sacredly, which is that the entire reason we work as professors, I think, is because we are interested in not just our own view, but hearing the views of other people who disagree with us so that we might expand our horizons and learn something in the you know few decades I have on this planet um, and maybe change my view. Right. I think one of the things I, I was thinking about it and I, I was thinking, you know, is what I want people to do is it that they want them to be more open to other views. And, and I actually realized it's not even openness. Yeah. It's, it's just curiosity. And I think yeah. what what is sort of shocking or appalling to me, and I, I, I think you, there was evidence of this pre pandemic is a growing lack of curiosity in how other people think. And when you see a view that you disagree with, you're not, it's not that you have to be open to, I mean, it's great if you're open to changing your mind, but most people aren't open on yeah, most right. issues to changing their mind. I mean, that's fine. That's normal, but it's the lack of even curiosity or wanting to hear out the other side, the sort of reflexive label or censor and then fight about whether censorship is actually technically censorship or not. You know, it's the, it's <laughs> yeah, the sort yeah, of yeah, desire yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. rapidly um, silence and ignore it and, and a kind of a lack of curiosity. And I guess I've, you know, part of what drew me to first journalism and then academia was curiosity about other people's arguments, including 
especially including arguments I disagree with. I'm, I'm probably more curious about the arguments I disagree with because that's where you clarify your own views yes. and, and learn the most from. And it's I, it's sort of amazing and terrifying to me that, that we seem to have lost that. And that needs to be something that that we would have to go out and defend. It seems obvious to me, but it seems like it's been... Uh, you know, been lost. I guess when people are scared and when they're anxious, um, I, I'm not surprised that they sort of go back to those sort of primal emotions. Uh, I guess I'm surprised by how many people did it and how esteemed some of the people were who did it. But let me talk about this expertise issue at least a little bit to pick on this. Um, I almost feel like, and correct me if I, if, if, I mean, well, and tell me what you think, I guess. I guess I almost feel like, um, you know, it's just a form of ad hominem on Twitter in the sense that sometimes you say something and say, well, you know what, this was something they threw at me. They're like, you know, you're not a public health expert, so you really, you shouldn't comment. And I say, you know what, actually, you may not know this, but I, I had a public health degree at Johns Hopkins and I've been waiting to waiting to show this degree. <laughs> like, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so then they say, then they say, well, you're not an epidemiologist. I was like, actually, you know, I'm actually on the faculty of epidemiology. I was like, oh, they're like, fuck. Okay, then they're like, well, you're not an ID doctor. And I was like, God, you got me, you got me. Then the next person, the next person comes at me and they say, um, you are an expert, but you're an ivory tower, son of a bit. You know, you're an ivory tower guy. You don't know what it's like in the real world. Then I'm like, well, you know, my clinic is in the county hospital. They're like, that doesn't count, you know. So it, it, so it goes both ways. You can be faulted both for lacking expertise, relevant expertise. We see that often. Um, you can also be faulted for for being having expertise that disconnects you from the real life emotions of people. And I guess I just boil down to it like at the end of the day, you're just not talking about what I'm saying. You're talking about whether or not I'm qualified to have this opinion. And that to me is a form of ad hominem. Um, I don't know. How do you think about I mean, yeah. And, 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 and what does your research suggest on how the populace thinks about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I I completely agree with you. I'd add a third category, yeah. which is I I also think there's there's the the sort of mislabeling. This is more common in in the press, although people do it to themselves on Twitter. The the claiming a credential that you don't actually have. So instead <laughs> yeah. of instead of resting on a good argument, you say, "Well, I am a you know I get uh, elevated right. to something." You see you this use in, in the credentialism all the time, to make your claim. Yeah. Whoever they call is is the leading expert on yeah. X, and it's just whoever they happen to. So yeah, no, I think the misuse of of uh, you know, credentialism has become a, you know, it, it's become the sort of proxy for not actually engaging yeah. you know, a substantive argument. I think it's incredibly problematic. I think another example is the sort of guilt by association. It's the like you, you know, you once co-wrote an article with Ian it is, so therefore you're not qualified. <laughs> you, therefore you're biased yeah, and not qualified to speak on it or the sort of funding. You know, I, I think there's, there's plenty you can criticize about. I, I think the Great Barrington Declaration, I think you can criticize the notion of science by petition, but, yes, that's but what to I, reduce yes, that yes. document to, oh, it's just the product of Koch brothers funding strikes me as, as I mean, it, both it fails to articulate a substantive objection to the arguments, which yes. is what people, right, if someone is on the fence, what they really want is substantive engagement, not just labeling it. And I don't think it's a particularly compelling explanation, right? A lot of the people who, the, I mean, the, the, the authors of it certainly, espouse those views, not just since the beginning of the pandemic, but in some ways it infuses their entire professional <laughs> careers. And it seems to come out of a good faith set of yeah. views about the balance between public health and, you know, other forms of public health and other, you know, other issues. It seems to come out of a long standing. And so to just sort of dismiss it and say, look, we can see where it was funded. Therefore, we don't even have to talk about it. It strikes me as, you know, incredibly problematic that I think it's the same thing as credentialism. It's this it's kind of throwing up uh you know right we counted we we you know we did a survey and we counted more people who signed this petition than signed this petition yeah, and yeah, therefore that... acts it's very problematic and it's also problematic because i think domains of expertise right expertise is incredibly important i don't want anything i right the, the reason dennis and i are doing this is we we favor expertise and we want to defend it and so we are entirely pro expertise but to claim that expertise can solve all problems, right? That, that there's no sort of value judgments or public policy issues that are that are beyond expertise, right? A lot of problems are complicated. They're multidimensional. They implicate multiple areas of expertise, and then they implicate values, which are not really, you know, experts can talk about them, but values are also something that everyone should be talking about. Everyone has sort of a a, a way, you know, in, in thinking about the balance between different things. Everyone's voice matters in that, and so. When experts say, well, I have this credential or the media says this person has this yeah, credential and yeah. therefore this debate is closed, it shuts off the ability to have a conversation about, um, you know, about values and about trade offs and about what kind of society we actually want. And I think that's that's almost the worst part to me is that it it, it sort of narrows and, and hollows down the public sphere. And I think 
you know, part of what populism is, is a, an attempt to, you know, and often flawed, but an attempt to try to oh, recreate that, up. That, that sense of public discussion. Okay, so I, I just want to highlight a few things that you said that I really agree with you. I mean, the question of, is science a contest of who gets the most signatories? And I think that's nonsensical, uh, because if you if you held that view throughout most of human history, uh, you get a lot of signatures signing on some stupid things. I mean, that's just the bot- things that were patently incorrect. But of course, because the consensus is not what science is, it's a process. The next thing I think you make a terrific point is conflict of interest. You know, I'm somebody who's a big, uh, you know, if you listen to the show, I, I mean, I talk about conflict of interest a lot. I've studied it. I've you know, done a bunch of papers on it. But my view of it when, when I come across an academic cancer drug art I mean that's my you know where that's where I'm usually in that space a cancer drug article I think this drug is bad and I think this paper oversells it the first thing I do is I go through all the things about the article I like like I don't like the con- or things I don't like I don't like the control arm I don't like the blind I don't like this I don't like that I don't like this and this is how it biases it towards this conclusion blah 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 and then the last thing I say and by the way all the authors have financial conflict of interest and blah, blah, and you know we know that, that that correlates with these kinds of things okay but so my point is that you know I'm I'm using it as as the frosting on the cake it's not the cake itself um in this particular case I think it the harder thing to agree, to acknowledge is the Koch brothers are not paying Jay Bhattacharya $5 million to go around and saying that this is his view. This is, in fact, his view. Um, and and actually, I'm not even sure to what degree they're—I they're, actually think if you actually started to analyze it, they may even have a net career decrement in lifetime earnings by having this view because they're going to be faced, facing professional retribution for years to come. And I was like, a lot of these people, you know, when you talk about consulting, if they had just kept their mouth shut about COVID and just consulted for companies on the side, they can make a lot of money. So— this is actually, is actually, if anything about conflict of interest, this may even hurt their, their financial outcomes. But anyway, that, this is a technical point. But it's fundamentally, it is not the case they hold this view because of a conflict. They believe this. You may think they're wrong and ill-informed or misguided, and but they truly believe what they're saying. And, and to say otherwise and not engage with the argument, that's just, a, it's cheap and it's, and, and, and it's, it's silly. And, 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 and there are plenty of us who still see that. The next thing I want to say is, demonization, sanctification. I've noticed that, you know, so John was quickly demonized. Um, I saw things that said that, like, you know, look at this son of a bitch in his white suit. You know, they're like, they don't like his, right. uh, I was like, the white suit is what when I When you get. really can't win an argument, you go to the clothing. <laughs> to that's the the, clothing. Yeah. And then they found some picture of me in a white blazer. And they're like, look at you in a white suit club. You once co-authored with I him. I forgot and, mine, did I? Yeah, you, you didn't forgot yours. White, but, no, that's right. Um, yeah, so then they talk about his white suit and... You know how he's done like a thousand papers and everyone was trash. I was like, every every he didn't even get one right by you know by just luck of the draw. They're all bad. Right. Okay, fine. Um, but you know, so that to me is demonization. Um, and, and but there's the opposite sanctification. I think it's also a primal emotion. And I think Fauci is the sanctified guy. Um, and I actually you know like I actually really love I really like the guy. I mean, I used to I ran into him on like three occasions at the NIH, and they're all kind of funny cocktail party stories that I tell people. And I read his book, and I like his book, and he's a kind of somebody I look up to. I mean, there's no, you know, I, I, I'll be honest. I, I've always looked up to him and I've co-authored with his wife. So, you know, Dr. Chris Grady, who's an expert in her own regard. Um, so, okay. So that's my, I'm guilty there too. Um, um, and I, so I, you know, I love the Fauci, uh, Grady family. Um, but, um, you know, when, when he said recently that he had played a fact a certain way to right. engender a policy response. I wrote something about it because I think that's right. just not the way you should play it. The scientist should say the science and the policymaker should play the policy. Um, and I got so many things back at me, which is like, why are you critical of Fauci? Why do you hate Fauci? Why weren't you critical of Scott Atlas? And I was like, first of all, I, I was critical of Scott Atlas when he said things that I disagreed with. Uh, when he said a few things that I actually thought were sensible, I gave him points for that. Um, and, and I'm not hating on Fauci. I like the guy. I'm just saying that you can like someone and they can get a few things wrong and you can, um, and, and so, you know, and that's true for both Yonides and 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 Fauci um but but I do think that that's another emotion in this space I'm an expert you should believe me because of expertise instead of argument you're not an expert you're too much of an expert or or we we just it's I mean I think it's the psychological thing of splitting like what people who suffer from certain mental disorders do is the world is either black or white there there's John Yonides in a white suit but he's the devil and Fauci in a black suit but he's a hero you know so I think it's a bad space Okay, then last Yeah, time. no, and it, no, it, I think it, it drives out any room for, for nuance yeah. and for having a nuanced view. And I, I, you know, there's nothing at all inconsistent with liking someone, respecting them, admiring them, and thinking that they got a, a call wrong, that they wrote One that, call that, you know, either in the IUD case career. That, that the op-ed yeah. was wrong or that Fauci was wrong on yeah. the, you know, that that was not the appropriate way to message, you know, about herd immunity. I think that, like those are, you can, you can hold a critical view while also respecting someone and we seem to have lost this you know we could talk about 
why. And we, I think there are a bunch of factors leading into it, but I think, you know, that ab- inability for people to hold more nuanced views or express them. And, and then the immediate assumption that if you write a piece that you, that right, you've, de- you've attacked Fauci by, by critiquing one thing, therefore you are anti-science and anti-Fauci, right? It's, you, yeah, I know. There's no yeah, I'm space for, yeah. for nuance. And yeah. it, it's a, it leads to a sort of ludicrous conclusions about what people actually think. And I think it's a real, yeah, it's really limiting our ability to actually discuss these in an intelligent and helpful way. No one is going to be right all the time. And conversely, probably no one is wrong all the time. Of course. Yeah. So, I mean, it's impossible. Possible, I think, to be both like right all the time or wrong, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, you'd have right. to be really lucky and dumb or smart, you know. Um, right. The media part of it is something you alluded to, and I, I guess here's my observation. I'm curious to what your observation is. Um, you know, very early on, it, it um, well, maybe I, I don't even want to get that far. I just want to say that um, I, I've been fascinated by the voices the media has chosen to amplify. I think there is some positive feedback loop between people who choose to make themselves visible on social media and who get covered in the news and go on those 50 second clips. I happen to also think television news is like the worst form of information dissemination possible. These little worse sh- than Twitter. I, I actually think it might even be because at least Twitter, I don't have to. Twitter, s- you can respond. I can right. respond and I can move away. <laughs> right. But I have to subject when you're when you're stuck in that airport and it's got CNN blaring over your head. Um, back in the good old days when we could go places, um, you know, it was a it was a cruel and unusual punishment, but. Um, some of the observations I had was that some of the people I see on TV all the time now were people I saw on TV in January, February saying, don't worry about COVID. The flu kills more people than COVID each year. And now they're like, oh, COVID, 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 you know, I was like, and then the, so, but they don't get the, the, the benefit that, you know, that the, the John, you know, he, he's, he's, he's being held accountable for every zero on his, um, you know, his stat piece. Um, even though I think that people aren't reading that as, as, um, as one would fairly read that piece, uh, because, well, anyway, side note, I just recently re- reread the piece and I'm like, OK, he is absolutely not predicting 10,000 deaths. He's giving that at, at first. He says something that like a very low ball estimate. And then he says a high ball estimate. He says he doesn't believe in the high ball estimate. But that doesn't necessarily mean he believes the low ball estimate. He doesn't right. say what not he to mention that the piece itself is actually a How piece about estimate. the collection of data yeah, right. and, know, and the use of data and decision making and has turned out, I think, to be entirely correct in his prediction that we <laughs> yeah. didn't have enough data yes. and we weren't we did nothing to actually run trials to collect the right kind of data and that we continue to face that problem and that we don't have answers so in that sense the headline i mean you can say it's not the central claim of the piece but it is actually the headline the headline of the piece is about a data fiasco right? yes it's not about fiasco. the ifr and it got turned into a piece about the ifr right and it, it's actually a piece about how we need more data to inform policy making. I just, which I, I just, think I just wasn't re- is true. Yeah, I just reread it again, and it actually is a hundred percent accurate. I mean, he he say he, the whole the whole theme of the piece is I don't know. It could be it could be as bad as they say it is, or it could be less bad. He doesn't believe it could be more bad than they say it is because all of the biases that existed at that time were that they were going to get the worst estimate. And in fact, they did. It was you know three point four percent IFR slash CFR back then. They were sort of one and the same. Um, anyway, and then and then he says that it could be as low as this. He says there's only seven deaths in the Diamond Princess cruise ship, and ergo it's statistically unreliable to extrapolate this to the population. But he said, let me do that anyway. And then that gives him a ten thousand number with one percent. You know, and then people say he said ten thousand. He said ten thousand. He never. Never fucking said 10,000, okay? You're not reading it. All right, fine. All right, if you want to, I mean, you're just not reading it correctly, but reading things correctly, is, is, that's a high bar. Okay, um, the question, all right, so, but I mean, so I think we, we both read that the same way, and I'm not trying to be charitable to the guy. If he said something that I thought was wrong, I'd call him out on it. Um, I, I mean, I have no skin in the game. Uh, he's not paying me. <laughs> um, and we're not co-authoring again. Um, I, I doubt that, I mean, uh, we have our own lives now. Um, uh, so um, and and uh, and so my question to you though is the media coverage. What do you think? Yeah, no, I I, I agree, and I th- I think it's I mean it's a complicated problem, and I, I think I've thought about it before, and I think it just it's the severity of the issue is so much stronger in the context of a pandemic. But the media rewards, and I say this as a, as a former journalist and someone who has a lot of respect for the media, but you know the the reality of coverage is that the media is going to reward voices that can simplify and simplification often requires a degree of exaggeration and I think is often sort of at cross purposes with true expertise right I think of true expertise as you, you know you you do have you do form an opinion and a judgment but you're also very aware of and curious about the limits of that and you're calibrating your level of confidence appropriately and so for instance you know I, I don't want to necessarily speak about you know science because it's not my field, but right, the, the more novel in general, I think you could say the more novel the issue, 
the lower your confidence should be in your conclusions, because the more novel it is, the less you know, the more uncertainty there is. And so expertise, I think, is both about you know, using sound judgment and reason and data and, and, and knowledge, but also about calibrating your level of certainty appropriately. And I think the reality of media coverage is it doesn't reward that. It doesn't, it doesn't want the sort of, oh, you know, maybe this, maybe that. It wants the strong, strong predictive quote. And so I think there's always going to be an inherent bias in coverage towards, you know, quotes that therefore oversimplify, exaggerate, make things seem worse than they are, or one-sided. And it, it could cut in either direction. Yeah. I think in this pandemic, it's cut in one particular way for the most part. Um, and I also think that that there's also a a way in which we as academics can be quite complicit in this. And I think about, right, again, not in the science context, but I think about the times where I've been called by a journalist on an issue where I like, well, you know, I sort of, I know I, I have genuine background knowledge and then I've read about it in the New York Times that morning. Does, does the combination of those two things qualify me to be quoted as an expert on that subject? Certainly the media would and will quote me as an expert yeah. on it. And maybe there are ways in which I could make the argument that that's my job to sort of help provide that context. But I also think we all need to sort of step back and say, do I, do I really, you know, what level of certainty do I have here? My, is my, is my credential being used sort of to, to create a foregone conclusion? That's not really one that I've actually spent a lot of time studying or thinking about, am I just sort of giving my prior opinion and applying it to this, right? I think it's a, a very complicated, right? I'm, I'm totally in favor of, I think, science, scientists and, and academics need to engage the media, but there's an inherent tension and, and problem. And I think the pandemic has really brought out the sort of uh, worst in it. Plus, I think the fact that I think at least certain journalists without naming names have been clearly choosing their sources based on Twitter, which is not necessarily a representative, right? I, I didn't even, I would, lo- I would love to know, I've actually thought about th- this as a sort of little empirical data collection you could do, figure out what percentage of scientists are actually on Twitter, figure out what percentage of people who have written preprints on COVID are actually on Twitter, and figure out what percentage of people quoted in the newspapers are on Twitter. It would I be, suspect the third category is vastly larger yes. than the, the first two categories. And and I bet if you add a little modification and looked at not just being on Twitter, but actually saying a lot of crap on Twitter and like, like tweets per month, the correlation right. between being quoted in the New York Times and tweets per month on Twitter is going right. to be really- Or the number of yeah. siren alarm emojis that you use in your Twitter feed <laughs> relative to the number of stories. Well, I not mean, to name any names again. I know not to name names, although I know exactly the charlatan that comes in my mouth. No, there's like one person that really gets me, gets me so bad. Well, what, was, what was interesting? I, again, I'll, I'll, we can try to avoid you yeah, know, know, naming names because I don't want. I, I again, I yeah, actually don't want to be in the position of criticizing people in part because I actually think most people are. I think you know, even the people who I think are abusing expertise, many cases are. I think acting in good faith, and yes, I think what, what astounded me was that, that an article about exactly. Um, I think the person who we're both talking about um, and and a lot of scientists saying, look, you, you know, they may be exaggerations. They may be oversimplifications. They might even be downright wrong sometimes, but he's on the right side. Yes, and I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm not right going to discourage someone who's on the right side. The right side of we history. We need all the help we can get, you know, all the help we, we, we can get to get the message out there. And I think that's such a problematic. I mean, it amazes oh, me that, that I would have really, to defend the view is, that we should not re- reward inaccuracy. Um, because it's on the right side, but, but, you know, people are sort of openly saying, look, as long as he's on the right side, I'm not going to, I'm not going to call him out for it. I mean, I, I think that the, the two hardest things that I find in, in the current mental space, I mean, now of policy and, and I, I, I mean, I'll have to admit, I mean, listeners of this podcast will know that I, I, you know, I'm probably very similarly inclined to you. I am a, I'm a very left of center person. I'm a progressive. Um, I, I have a very progressive policy agenda. Um, my my worry is that there are fringe elements on my side, far beyond my position, that take very hardline and indefensible positions that I disagree with, and that they are making it harder for me because they're making everyone vote for the other guy. They're making everyone go to the other side because they're so nutty that everyone looks over and they're like, we don't want to be associated with that nut job. And we just on the left, we have to get these people in line and say, just like on the right, they have to they have a far right 
in there, and there are a lot of problems with the far right. They need to get those people in line, and they do everything they can to sometimes distance themselves, but not really distance themselves. But I don't think we on the left do anything to distance ourselves from the extreme left positions, the the intolerance to alternative points of view, the idea that anyone who disagrees with you is a bad person, they should be silenced, they shouldn't be allowed to speak, we should shut them up, they should be fired, they shouldn't have every, ever have gainful employment in this country because they made one off-color comment one day. That is an ex- that is a Salem, Massachusetts, 1600 kind of view that I don't hold, and it's an, an antithetically not liberal. It, it has no tolerance and no forgiveness and no path to redemption, um, and, and I disagree, and, and, I, and I think that they, that's a miscalculation of the progressive philosophy. Um, similarly, on, on, on this issue, um, we were talking about media. I just want to make one last point. I mean, I think <clears throat> I, I don't always understand people's motivations. Um, like some, I mean, I, I mean, I guess, I guess if if there, if you have something to say on the issue that is novel and interesting, by all means, say it. And if you really believe it, say it. But I do think the algorithms reward increasingly being pulled to a pole of denial. Oh, it's not real. COVID's in your mind. It doesn't exist. Those are just uh, pictures, fake pictures. <laughs> All right, that's not right. And also fear mongering. Um, there was. Th- did you hear about the teacher who died a- in the school? That's what somebody sent me. This teacher, because uh, obviously that's we'll talk about that issue. Um, and, and I was like, yeah, but you know, the schools are not open there for six months, so the teacher may have succumbed to COVID, but they didn't get it at school because there's no school there. So your anecdote actually doesn't prove anything. Um, anyway, but um, but but th- but there are individuals who exploit this. Um, and not calling them out when they say things wrong, when they say, um, you know, I have decided that schools should be closed because of the B.1.1.7 variant. Um, when they say that, uh, you know, not calling them out is, is very dangerous, leads to misalignment of policy. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, how do we, this sort of the political question of, in any movement, there are people who have different ideological views. And I'm here left of center. I'm probably an Elizabeth Warren progressive. And I believe fiscal policy is the way for true progressivism. Um, and, and, and I also believe in cultural change too, but I think that's trickier. Um, but there are people who are far more extreme than I am. You know, do I need to herd them in? Do I need to bring them in and, and nip at them? Like, uh, you know, um, I mean, how, how do we control the people in your own party who poison your messaging for the for for the for the broader populace. It's a good question. I, I mean, I, I don't have an answer, but I do think you sort of said this. I think one of the real problems is that we focus so much on in, in coverage and also just sort of emotionally. And I think Twitter as a platform, right, rewards and causes you to do this. We we over focus on the fringe elements. And so that I mean, I think that was a big motivation behind the. The, the stat piece that Dennis and I did that right everyone and and the thing that actually sort of motivated me to write it was hearing um you know several uh po- politicians and also hearing Dr. Fauci say our you know our biggest some version of our biggest problem is the epidemic of pandemic denial and all the people who are denying the pandemic and there are clearly people who are denying the pandemic, yes. right? I, right. Don't like the, the straw man version of our article is that we said no one denies the pandemic, right? We didn't. We said Americans largely believe that it's a serious threat and are largely taking public health measures seriously. And I think like every statistic you can possibly find bears that out. I mean, you can debate, I guess you could debate what the threshold for largely is, but certainly well more than half, but really, you know, we're talking 70, 90% on a lot of questions and issues are you know, taking it quite seriously. And yet the 10% of people who have fringe views in either direction, like yes. either they think it doesn't exist or they think that, you know, we're hiding the, you know, millions of people who have died, who haven't been counted in the U.S., you know, mm-hmm. who have sort of fringe views and either they take up a disproportionate amount of, of concern and fear. And we become, I mean, I think we are, right, don't get me wrong, misinformation is a problem and it's a, a thing that we should take seriously, but I think we've become so panicked about misinformation that we just think it's everywhere and we think everything is driven mm-hmm. by mis- in misinformation. And actually it's not clear, you know, this is a, I think we could have a broader conversation about this, not clear that there's really a worse problem than there historically has been with respect to misinformation. misinformation. And really probably, you know, no real evidence to me that the thing that has caused you know, the, the, the U S response to be bungled is the fact that most Americans don't believe that, right. I mean, a, a lot of responses we, or we got, or part of why we wrote it was a lot of people think like half of the country doesn't believe the pandemic exists. There is no data <laughs> that supports it's, it's, it's not true. Not it's simply case. not true. Not now you could say some people aren't taking it as seriously as you'd want them to. That's a, that's a valid viewpoint, but it's not the same thing as denial. And once we sort of start labeling 
it and obsessing about it and turning it, then we start to turn everyone into a fringe element. And then we sort of lose the ability to have a rational debate. Now, I, I, I guess to your broader point, I, I, sometimes the fringe, I mean, I think, you know, outlier views can be helpful, but they need to be kept in context. And I think what we've done is, and I think Twitter, I think amplifies this problem, right? We've, we've taken those views and now we spend all of our time kind of obsessing about them and panicking about them and worrying about them. And, you know, the reality is we give them sort of undue attention and then we can't have an intelligent conversation among people who actually could have a more or want to have a more nuanced conversation because we're spending all of our time on that. That's well said. I mean, I, um, the, the denial thing it, to me is interesting because when a government is not taking coordinated dis- appropriate action, um, it leads to two excesses. I mean, there's an excess of actions taken by certain tend to be democratic left to center places that are, that are crazy. Children should not be on playgrounds. I mean, okay, uh, slaughter the goat while you're at it too. We'll ward off the the bad spirits. I mean, okay, do whatever the do whatever you want if you don't want to. Okay, the children on playgrounds. That's not where it spreads, by the way. Okay, outdoor restaurants are going to be demolished. Um, okay, well, you know that really probably wasn't the driver. Um, um, and and then the other excess, of course, where you know people are telling me about what it's like in Florida and Texas. I'm like, oh my god, what is going on over there? Um, that's also bad policy. Um, uh, the idea of of denialism feeds into this idea that it's just a matter of individual people's personal responsibility. And that's something that on the left, we've always, um, it's not been part of our credo. You know, when people use substances, we say, you know, we have to look, I mean, of course you can say you shouldn't have become a heroin addict, bad person. Um, but we've learned, I think, through a lot of empirical evidence and trial and error, that that's not a very persuasive strategy. And we need to think about what are the drivers of addiction? Where does it come from? How is it fostered in communities where there is no upward mobility, where industry has left and the opioid addiction comes? Um, We think about systemic failures. But for COVID-19, it's just that those people didn't wear the mask. You know, those people had a backyard dinner party. Those people did it. Um, It's fundamentally, to me, um, not consistent with liberal liberal progressive philosophy as i understand it um and it's an easy narrative to succumb to um and and i and, and i just think of the example that really sets me off was like i saw um a doctor who practices in in i believe in southern ohio and he went to the home depot and the home depot ohio has a mask mandate state of course god forbid they do anything else they got the mask mandate state and he's in the home depot and um he he um he says that a lot of people walk around without masks and he goes up to the home depot employee and he says uh you know you can do anything about this you have a mask mandate in your state this this person walking around without a mask and the home depot employee says well home depot corporate says you know like lay off don't don't go talk to that guy and he was like and he comes on twitter and he's like this is ridiculous boycott home depot hashtag boycott home depot home depot bad 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 they're spreading virus and i was like just think about it a second i was like you're not we're not talking about masks you know i actually think it's quite reasonable when you're shopping around a home depot to wear, put it on you you know you they make you wear pants they wake you make you wear a mask that's enough for me i wear the mask I'm always in the mask, and I actually kind of like the mask. I like the anonymity the mask provides. It. I mean, that, I, I have to be honest. I do like it. Um, so I like the mask, um, and I'm in the Home Depot, and I was just there recently too. Um, but 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 what you're mandating is not the mask. You're asking the Home Depot employee, some 17 year old kid, 18 year old kid, making I don't know some measly amount of money, um, who has you know no safety net probably. Um, you're asking that person in Southern Ohio, Red Ohio, to go up to some random person and say, "You sir are not allowed to shop at Home Depot unless you wear the mask." Best case scenario, the person says, "Well, thank you, good sir. Let me put the." mask on worst case scenario they start screaming at you what are you gonna do call the cops the cops are gonna come in every time he screams louder the virus particles being exhaled everywhere and then worst case scenario this guy's armed to the teeth and so i was thinking to myself home depot has probably thought about this for more than one second and they said that although it would be bad publicity for home depot to be the store where people walk around without masks it would be worse publicity for home depot to be the store where somebody pulled out a glock and just shot up the whole fucking store because somebody asked them to wear a mask that's their calculus okay and and i actually agree with home depot corporate 
you don't pay this and kid. And I think it is actually that I could be, it, it could yeah. have changed, but I think it is also the CDC recommendation that, that not, co companies should not enforce because of exactly uh, of that. Course. They should of not course. escalate a situation. So it's actually, yeah, okay, unless right. it's changed, I haven't no, looked recently, but it is actually official public health guidance that companies shouldn't, you know, they should tell people, but they shouldn't attempt to enforce it because it might risk escalation. I agree. And that's the only sensible thing you could come to. I mean, what else you want to do? And so like, yeah, that's life. You know, you don't always get what you want, but you do what's best. And sometimes you, you know, you, you don't escalate. Um, anyway, to me, I guess, I don't know how this tied into what we were talking about, but I guess to me, it's emblematic of, of, I think some of the failures here, because if you confront this person on Twitter, which I did not do, I was scared to, if I had said like, that would be actually, maybe I did do it because I'm that kind of crazy person who's willing to pick these fights and try to thread the needle, uh, which I, th but I think you could, I mean, so easily somebody could throw me, well, you're anti-mask. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm happy to wear it. Um, uh, at the same time, I have familiarized myself with all of the evidence and, um, and I, I would not describe it as some have described it as quote, a parachute because it is in fact not that, but it's okay to recommend things that have some uncertainty. Um, I think that's okay, but you, you know, you want to have your cake and eat it too. You want me to wear it and also tell you it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. I, I can't can't do that because, in fact, I've, you know, I, I believe there's some residual uncertainty around it. Um, anyway, so, but, but his policy is different. It's not about masks. It's about mask mandating and enforcement, which is a whole other can of worms and can introduce all this nuance. Um, all right. I forget where we started, but any thoughts on this? Well, you, you were, you were talking, I, I mean, I completely agree because you were, you were talking about the, the more sort of moralizing aspect of yes, it and, and that is disturbing as a progressive. And I, I feel this very much too, sort of disturbing how quickly we've switched to this sort of narrative of everything being about individual blame. And yeah. I think one of the things that really does is deflect, and I, I think this is sort of where it comes from, I think it's sort of stoked by politicians that deflects blames from, from their politicians failures. for yeah. their yeah. failed yeah. policies, yeah. right? Yeah. And so to me, the, you know, the, the two things that really drive it home are, uh, you know, first that People like Julia Marcus have been warning us about lockdown fatigue since I think she wrote the first piece about that in April, like yeah. saying this, this will happen. This is a real thing. And, you know, we spent the whole summer shaming people for being alone on the beach without wearing a mask or for going on oh a walk in gosh, the woods yeah. without a mask by themselves. And we, we lost the ability to actually effectively message anything around the holidays. And to me, a, a, you know, a policy, the, the notion that that's the failure of individual people when it was a predictable failure of the policy, right? That you can't say I've designed this perfect policy. It would have worked, but for the people, right? That, <laughs> yeah, exactly. that the people are that's part of the policy. And exactly. if you know, yes. and if you have been yes. warned that it yes. won't work in the real world, that is a failure. That, that is what public policy yes. design is. Public policy is not designing an abstract policy. It's designing a real one. And so politicians and, and, and leaders sort of failure to contemplate predictable lockdown fatigue is something that they should be blamed for. And I, I also think that, you know, that the other one that that that, that drove it home for me was the, um, and I, we call him out for it in the piece, but that, you know, when Governor Cuomo said the thing about, you know, everyone, this, if you listen to my advice, no one would ever get COVID again. This is really simple. Everyone who gets COVID, it's all their fault. It's just yes. like people who eat too much cheesecake. And I'm like, you, you just managed to shame two cut like, and what, <laughs> and you're, you're supposed to be a Democrat. Yes, and this is I know. Sort of not a position I know. Associated with the the standard right like you can have some amount of moral agency and blame but you yes. can also think about systematic structural yes there's an problems obesity epidemic and ways it's not to make because, them better yes and exactly and and that, that that to me that's a progressive a, a progressive philosophy is to look beyond individuals and ask how systems can be restructured and how systems have been perversely structured to give you this outcome which is this obesity epidemic of course we've done a lot of things subsidizing a lot of shit the people have been eating for 20 30 years you know it's not just the people to blame it's the way we've subsidized food products and similarly this we have put in like let's talk about lockdown one second i mean people say are you pro lockdown anti-lockdown i think whether or not lockdown is effective at the right time that's one question but one thing we can all agree on is when the virus is not doing anything locking down at that moment is not helpful so if we go back to march when we saw new york city create you know collapsing on itself certainly new york city should be in lockdown i mean if any places to be in lockdown it should be new york city but why are places in lockdown where there were no cases at all that was just fatiguing people so that later they didn't want to do it anymore because they've been locked down when they weren't you know so i mean you so you know the right drug at the right time is a medicine and at the wrong time it's a poison um lockdown can is not you know it can be a bad thing if you deploy it at the wrong moment uh, anyway back to what you were saying about cuomo cuomo was saying um, he, he, you know, the, this narrative of personal responsibility, which is an anti-democratic, anti-liberal narrative, um, but it, it, it takes the blame away from him. 
Yeah. Well, and the other thing I, I, I guess this is one thing I, I'd hope to get, you know, we got a range of responses to our piece and no one quite articulated this for me, but I would love for someone to articulate the argument for why sort of blaming or shaming or calling someone a denier is helpful. So, <laughs> right. You, you, let's say you disagree with Dennis's and my view. And you say that actually, if you traveled over Thanksgiving, it means you deny the severity of COVID, right? You, that, that I guess you could reasonably say that, right. If you took that level of risk, it must mean you don't think it's, it's serious enough. So let's okay. say you disagree with that. My next question is how is it helpful to go to that person who went home to see their grandparents for Thanksgiving and to say, you're a COVID denier. Is that yeah. more likely to get them to engage in better behavior? Is that more likely to engage them in the kind of conversation you want them to be engaged with to try to come around to your point of view? Or is that more likely to alienate and polarize them and make them kind of move in the other direction? Right. The, I mean, that 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 to me is sort of the That's, extraordinary thing about the denier narrative that it's it's not just that I think it's sort of not true and it deflects blame, but I don't. I haven't yet to hear an argument for how it's helpful. I get the That's, argument why it's helpful to label someone like Trump a COVID, right? Like it's different when we're talking about public figures, right? Yeah. They should be called out every time a public figure says something inaccurate. They should be called out for it. That's that's clear. But, you know, sort of attacking individual people, making choices that are sort of within, you know, that, that a lot of other people are making during a difficult time and saying this makes you a bad person and a denier and a science denier. It's not just that I rate it. What is it supposed to accomplish? Is it? Yeah, is it, I mean, is it, there any so any it, way to think it could help? It makes you feel good. <laughs> right. Okay. okay right. So that, that's a childish yeah. emotion. Right. Okay. Then the next emotion is it will drive your Twitter followers, which f unfortunately your brain has been dopamine wired to do that. But your fundamental question is a question that, um, and you allude to this about the vax, how we combat people who don't want to get certain vaccines. Um, and it, it has long been a pebble in my shoe that I believe that a lot of the way in which people who feel morally justified that they're on the side of the good in combating these people, I believe have inadvertently given these people oxygen because they are too hostile, too mean spirited, too insulting. Um, and, 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 and by doing so, they're actually, I don't know, making the other side, this little contingency of anti-vax, whatever, stronger. Um, and I actually think, I don't know, I mean as somebody who studies drugs and vaccines like a lot and as somebody who gets a lot of vaccines and uses a lot of drugs but doesn't use all drugs i think it's interesting that we talk about vaccines like a category like we don't talk about drugs like are you pro drugs or anti drugs i'm like well no i like chop but i don't like selenex or you know i think that's that risk benefit is thing and like vaccines i'm like yeah i mean i like sars cov2 vaccines those were great i mean amazing the efficacy is good especially older people but when they start saying like oh is it, oh, 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 oh some people are saying like oh every 5 year old and 7 year old are going to get it before they go back to school i'm like whoa easy tiger that's a very different policy question the risk benefit of a 5 year old 7 year old getting it i don't know i think that risk benefit is very uncertain there's no clinical trial data yet we, from what I see from the AEs and the adults, I'm and and how AEs are re inversely related to age, um, potentially, um, it, it may not be a proposition that's that's readily palatable and something worth discussing. So I mean, even in the category like vaccines, where we are so you know pro MMR, you know pro uh, DTaP, uh, the sort of the key, the two cornerstone vaccines, I think there is some room to talk about them individually. But when I read uh, or see this anti-anti-vax movement and the anti-vax and then the anti-anti-vax and then like scientists or something in between where, you know, many of us um, like to think about vaccine trials and how they're constructed and the quality of vaccines and 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 we think of them separately. Um, and, and so I think that when the anti-anti-vax movement calls the anti-vax movement denials or, you know, all these sort of words they use. I'm not sure. I mean, you, you cite some data that suggests that they're not really gaining ground. Um, I wonder. Well, and I think it again yeah. conflates two different, right? I mean, I, I think there, there are groups that are so that, that are just anti-vax. There, there are people who are just adamantly anti-vaxxer and campaign about it and are spreading misinformation about yeah. it. And it's a legitimate problem, but we conflating that with sort of the, average, mildly skeptical, mildly curious person who wants to learn a little bit more about, you know, the average American who's like, I don't know, this is new. We call it Operation Warp Speed. Is it safe? I hear it's yeah. safe. I want to know a little bit more. Do I want to be the first? Right. That's not a 
you know, we, we might want everyone to immediately jump up and take it, but it's not crazy that they want a little more information. Yeah, and not. all of the statistics show people moving more and more in that direction. And now we're having another way, right? As we began, I think people are naturally more, again, this is not, you know, but I, I think I am trying, I'm not trying to speak as someone who studies this area. People study this and I think it's consistent with what they say, but just generally that notion that we would take someone who is, you know, in the sort of adamant campaigning against the existence of vaccines and lump them. And, that, and that's a real problem. And then we lump that with like the 40 percent of Americans who are like, oh, I'm not sure yet. I want to know more. And we say, well, that that whole group, they are all denialists and anti-vaxxers and, and, and science deniers. It's not helpful because those are two very different groups. And your policy treatment, right, there, there may be no treatment for the most adamantly anti-vaxxer group, right? That may be a group that is unreachable and you need to That's think about thing. That's, you know, yeah. mandates. They may but be the other group, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and you decide whether it's worth, you know, mandatory vaccines or that's a complicated question. Yeah, but right. the group that is reachable, labeling them prevents them from engaging with you and makes them feel like they've been put on the defensive immediately and doesn't take their questions or concerns seriously. And I, I think, you know, again, not my area of expertise, but I think that's the same across all these sort of areas where we label people who are skeptical of a particular policy. I mean, there's sort of like radical problematic skepticism that just rejects everything and that's a problem but most skepticism isn't that kind of skepticism most skepticism is sort of a mix of it's it's the good kind of skepticism it's a mix of curiosity and uncertainty and a toxic media environment and so on and you know it's there and we we need to engage it rather than just sort of you know lumping it together with with the more problematic form which is i think really a much smaller uh much smaller group yeah i um that, that's that's really well said. And um, I think that, you know, the, the Twitter majority, you know, I mean, there have been a lot of polling and Twitter, of course, is politically left of center. It's more Democratic leaning. Um, even among Democrats, it's probably more left of center than actual the center of the party. Um, and uh, it has a certain COVID narrative. Um, and that narrative probably is um, very reluctant to open schools, which is a, a policy question we're going to explore. Um, uh, it, it is a very pro-mask place, I think, Twitter. Um, um, it is very pro-vaccine. Uh, so am I, actually. I mean, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah I'm very pro-COVID vaccine, particularly uh, for older people and vulnerable people. Um, and I've been talking about the prioritization question. Um, there were a few missteps, I think, in the canonical Twitter Twitterati expertise. One was when the dexamethasone recovery trial came out, um, which shows this sort of home run, all cause mortality benefit in people requiring supplemental O2 and hospitalized with de from dexamethasone. There are these experts, you know, people who've written best selling books who are on, you know, the, the Biden advisory board who said, let's wait for the published paper. And uh, my head exploded because I'm like, you know, these authors have published the trial protocol, the statistical analysis plan. They have the press release with subgroup interaction coefficients. And I was like, and and frankly, I'm a little concerned that you don't read trials a lot because you know that this is not the standard. This is a very high level of transparency. This is a very cheap drug. Um, it should be given this second. Not You shouldn't wait one second. You're going to kill people while you wait. And also, um, the, the sort of the thing that was in the back of my mind was all these weeks you've been giving things for no reason at all. All, you know, which was what we did in the early pandemic. We just threw drugs into people, probably out of fear. Um, and now's the moment you want to see a peer-reviewed publication. It's like, shut up, you got to give this. So, I mean, that was something that I went against the grain and I got my, my inbox was just filled with just stupid, incompetent hate. And then now they've forgotten that, of course, I was right when they, when they quote, read the paper, which of course we know like 2% of people actually read the paper. All right. So anyway, that was one that I think they got wrong. Um, I think um, there was another one. I mean, I think the schools, everyone is getting wrong. Uh, I think uh, Emily Oster was the only one who's getting it right and willing to go public. Um, and, and there was an example, yeah. back to your point earlier about credentialism, that, you know, she, she yes, yeah, she's trained as an economist, but her field within economics is largely writing about public health. And she's written many peer-reviewed papers yeah. on public health using a valid methodology, right? I mean, I'm, again, yes. I don't mean no, this to say she's right or wrong even, just like she, she is actually... And there was an article in, um, I don't remember where the article yes, was. Yes, I remember. Uh, yeah, I know. That said, right, she is not an actual expert on public health. <laughs> and most public health people disagree and didn't quote a single public health person on her side and sort of labeled her. And the, right, it's, again, the sort of like the random misuse of, right there, it wasn't even correct. I mean, it wasn't even yeah, factually correct. It was correct. technically she inaccurate. Fact, She's in fact someone public who health. Yeah. And, right. and, but they created the narrative that she lacks. I mean, it's just, it's just mudslinging. It's just mudslinging and it's a distraction from... Her, her valid points. And I guess the thing I think is problematic in this debate is that, you know, um, unlike 
almost, you know, I'm like 1918 where, you know, a lot of the casualties were young people. And so the people who were not going and participating in social events were sacrificing and they themselves were benefiting. Here is a total inversion. The people who are sacrificing, they have a very little personal risk of, 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 of bad outcomes, even if they were to get the virus, contrary to what Twitter finds some anecdote and, and, you know, without denominators. But I mean, the reality is um, uh, on par with seasonal flu potentially even in some age groups a little bit lower than seasonal flu, uh, for particularly the age of school-age children in public schools, um, the risk is lower. And so they're asked to sacrifice an Im immeasurable sacrifice, which I think that that's the thing that people who study viruses don't understand about schools is, um, uh, and, 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 and I didn't understand it until I spent like a lot of time in July reading Schools is is like one of the last ladders of opportunity that we have left in this country. We've cut all the other ladders down. We got one ladder. It's got like four rungs on it. And we say, here's your only shot at it. And we're going to cut that ladder down. And when you cut ladders of opportunity, you, of course, affect human health. So there is a years of life lost. At some point, it's going to be there. Um, there's an estimate that came out that, you know, I have some quibbles with. I agree with some of the criticism. The estimate is not right. But the philosophy is right that there's some trade off here. Um, but discussing that trade off openly is very difficult. Um, and the fact the Europeans opened schools and, and they did not have these sort of catastrophic scenarios that people here still believe could happen. Um, and that's a form of misinformation that is not corrected. And all the usual um, fighters of misinformation are feeding into that. Um, the same the, the same Twitter fear um, narrative, um, it feeds into that. Yeah, I think, I mean, on the misinformation point, I, I have thought a lot, I want to be careful how I phrase this, but we spend a lot of time thinking about the, you know, the, the sort of total cranks on Twitter who are, again, I'll avoid naming names, but people who have a lot of followers and are sharing what I think most people of sort of all views would say is just misinformation. It's just wrong. They're, yeah. they're problematic. And we spend a lot of time worrying about them. But in a way, you know, and we should, we, right? It's worth worrying about them and it's worth thinking intelligently, not just, right, is, is blocking them actually helpful or does it actually make the problem worse? It's a complicated problem. It's worth engaging. But the sort of distortion that can be caused by a mainstream media narrative that covers only the negative studies about kids yes. in schools and doesn't cover countervailing studies or, you know, in, or chooses a particular, and even if it's a bias that's sort of, you know, not in the sense of, that the, the the newspaper has made a decision to be by it but just you know the reporter happens to have been drawn more to these studies or happens to have gotten a page one story on that day and even if it's completely innocuous that kind of distortion can i think have really massive impacts yes. on on public policy yes. because those are the, the things that are getting cited most often and taken most seriously at school board meetings and at city council meetings and in state legislatures yes. and yes the the sort of total cranks also a problem, but yes. I think we we don't spend we spend a lot of time in a panic about that, and very little time thinking about what the sort of subtle but steady distortion of news. And again, I, I try to mean distortion in a, in a not even a value laden way, just yes. inevitable distortion that occurs because of the way you have to cover a subject. Can really, I think, and I think schools is a good example of that, where we yeah. had you know the, the amount of coverage when. When there was the, uh, you know, I don't even, I, it, it was like it's been dropped as an issue, but the amount of coverage when there was concern about the link between COVID and Kawasaki syndrome. And it yes. was like the front page of every newspaper, yes. even when it was sort of very uncertain. And, and everyone and was saying, don't report it. And it was the front page of every, every And newspaper. then it just gets completely yeah. dropped. And that's a distortion that stays in people's minds. And I think really leads to a decision making environment that's unhelpful. And it's both maybe a harder problem and, a, and maybe a more consequential problem than, you know, I don't want to say more. No, no, no. I think really I, consequential I, to the sort of Twitter it, trolls. You're, you're, you're hitting a point that I, I've had difficulty articulating, which is that um, I think it's, it's the distortions within the mainstream that trouble me more than the known crazies. The known crazies, we can put a flag on, they're crazy. We all know they're crazy. At least educated people know they're crazy. The educated people participating in distortions kills me because then I'm like, who's left to who's left to see this? I'm like, is, is anyone left? I'm like all nervous. I'm on, the, I'm on the last one who sees that they're distorting it. I'll give you one example where I think it's they've they've screwed themselves because of their own distortions. Um, vaccine side effects and side effects after COVID. Now the long COVID narrative has swept the media. They are they they have they love it. It's a powerful narrative. 
And 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 I want to say very clearly because I've I've written a few articles on this and I want to always say it the right way because I don't want to miss say, say anything. Um, anybody who suffers anything after COVID, that suffering is real and it ought to be dealt with um, very really, and the medical profession ought to take that very seriously. Uh, to what degree that suffering is attributable to prior COVID is a scientific question that must be interrogated on a case by case basis. That's the distinction. And so if somebody's coming in after COVID and they're suffering and you want to try gabapentin or Lyrica or you want to try venlafaxine or some drug, run a randomized trial, see if it helps them or not. Um, uh, you know, have a very nice broad inclusion criteria. You're going to learn something. Um, but if you wanted to ask whether or not those symptoms are ha from having had COVID, you got to really do some really thoughtful science. It's not so easy. Um, and and, and um, the same Twitter experts who would proudly retweet a story that said, after COVID, five people had Parkinson's disease. Um, okay, these are 78-year-old people. Um, COVID linked to Parkinson's disease, no control arms, you know, no, no, uh, 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 no, no risk ratio, no, no attempt to quantify if this is beyond the baseline rate of developing Parkinson's disease. That same person, by, by promoting that narrative, what you're telling people is if event B happens after event A, I'm an expert, thoughtful person, and I can say event B is caused by event A. It happened after, ergo it is caused, and there's no, uh, you know, that, uh, that's how we accept facts. So if that's the, if that's your fact view, then if somebody gets a vaccine and somebody dies, like what happened in Brazil yesterday, some 41 year old woman died a day later in her sleep, or if somebody gets a vaccine and then five year days later, they get um, gastric cancer. They're going to say it was due to the vaccine. And then you're going to come in and say, no, careful studies have to be done before we attribute this to the vaccine, which is what you should have said for the Parkinson's too. You can't have this flaw. You have to be consistent because you're teaching people the wrong way of attributing causality. And the say, and, and, and so it really bothers me. It's, they're not a crazy person. This is the person who every, was on TV every day. And everyone says this is the person to ask. And they are not doing a good job on this. And, and, and so that to me is the insidious way in which you're breeding people to see, find faults with the vaccine that are not true and you're breeding them to, to like i mean you're, you're making their brain garbage because they're not they're not thinking clearly because you're not thinking clearly yeah and I, th I think we've become very uncomfortable and you know i don't know what to blame for this but we're not good at embracing some degree of uncertainty early in a story and by we i mean mm -hmm. many of the people who speak about it to the media the media and then readers of the media that a lot of these issues involve Right. They involve science and then they also involve a high degree of uncertainty because they're sort of an, you know, it's the early stages that we don't have enough data to answer a particular question. We we have a model about something, but we don't have enough information to infer causality. And those are, you know, complicated subjects, but the way they get presented, you know, in a lot of quotes from 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 experts in, in the media is right. This model proves X and then suddenly people believe that. And then a week later, Right, a model proves something the opposite, and they believe that for a while. And then, once it, once there's been enough reversals, then people don't know what to believe yeah. anymore. Right, they're just sort of using these one-off examples as trump cards. And it's partly because I think we're not good at messaging. And this was very clear early in the pandemic. Like, there's there's just no, seemingly no desire or appetite to message uncertainty in an honest way and to say, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, here's what we're afraid of, here's the worst case scenario, here's why that's really only a worst case scenario and not backed up. We're, we, we don't, we're not good at putting things in context. And I think the rea the result of that is an environment in which people, um, you know, sort of cherry pick whatever finding happens to support yeah. their particular narrative and also kind of lose faith in the whole endeavor because they say, well, you were telling me this and now you're telling me this. How can they both be true? And it's sort of like watching, you know, it's it's the joke of of all the, you know, every every stats book has, you know, has a the examples of like the, you know, studies about red wine yeah. causes cancer. Red yeah. wine makes you live forever. Yeah. Red wine you know, <laughs> gives you a heart attack the yeah. next day. Red yeah. wine is the secret to long life. And it's like watching that, but watching it in like fast motion yes. over the course of yes. 10 months with incredibly high stakes decisions involving, yes. Yes. you know, kids and lives yes. and the yes. balance yes. And, and watching sort of all the worst version of that coverage, but watching it play out in, you know, in rapid time and, and then watching no one, you know, watching people sit back and say, well, at least, you know, those scientists are on the, we're not going to correct it because it's on the right side of the issue. So yeah, we're not going to um, try to clarify the issue. And the irony of that red wine example is that one of the people who did some of the best work documenting why those sorts of issues continually flip flop is the man in the white suit who shall not and be now they're coming for him. <laughs> yeah, and now they're coming for him. <laughs> So 
so you know it's so funny that we're having this conversation because I've been thinking a lot of these things. I'm writing an article. Maybe it'll come in the next day or so. It's called um, "Next Time We Need More Than Pandemic Preparedness, We Need Scientific Preparedness." Okay, so um, maybe they're going to change my title. But my basic premise is that um, you know uh, I see a lot of these experts and they say like, "Oh, we need pandemic preparedness unit." I'm like, "Yeah, we do." Next time there's some pandemic, we can't be. This is, this is unacceptable. Um, and, and how many trillions have we lost? So, so many trillions have been lost that it would have been cheaper to invest a few hundred billion in having some preparedness and it would make sense. Um, but I want to think even beyond pandemics to scientific preparedness. There's going to be something, and I say radiation disaster, I say um, debris in our solar system hitting the planet. Okay, I'm not an expert on that, but I mean, maybe something like that. I don't know. What the hell? I mean, I, I, I'm not, I can't tell you what's going to happen, but something like that where rapid weather changes, um, some, something that's a problem that affects people, their lives, their livelihood, their day-to-day. Today, um, but also requires these scientists to give us some guidance. Um, and so I have a lot of things, but like my first thing is like, my first principle is like smart people will disagree. So like we should already agree right now, smart people are going to disagree. So don't go telling me that they're funded by some evil person. They're an evil person. They want people to die, blah, blah, blah. Just accept right now, whatever happens, somebody's not going to like it and they're going to disagree and they're going to be good faith disagreement. And you're going to have to either argue with them or not, you know, we, we need to create a space to do that. So that's all these things for the academy to do. Then the next thing, this is the one I want to ask you about. Um, a colleague of mine, this is a professor who's um, just, you know, really good. Um, he's got a background in, I don't want to say exactly what, but a lot of the fields that we're talking about, like this person's expertise is really good. And this is somebody who like, you know, I love to call and, and, and bounce an idea off. And this is a person who is a true academician because we have disagreed for years on some substantive issues and we always have a good laugh and get along well and discuss the issue. And he always gives me tips like, oh, you know what? Here's how you make your paper. Here's how you'd fix your paper. Uh, you know, even though he hates what I'm saying, you know, he, so that's the true academician. Okay. So he's been quiet on COVID. Didn't say a damn thing, nothing, no paper no nothing just very quiet and so i said you know why are you so quiet and he tells us quote there is zero professional upside for me to comment on covid19 policy okay so i thought about it for a while he's so right he's got a long career he's going to be in this business for 40 years he's been doing work before doing work after covid's going to come and go it'll be two years out of his 40 years he's got you know um He's got side projects he's working on. He's got main projects he's working on. He has grants. He's unlikely to get a COVID grant. It's unlikely to be a long-term theme in his thing. Um, he also sees what happens to people who who spout off. Um, if he comes in well, like Jay Bot, he's going to be tarred and feathered like Jay Bot. Um, if he comes in like John, he's going to be you know kicked to the back of the line. So he sees that, and he, and he sees even Emily. He sees Emily that you know she's getting a lot of shit and uh, potentially even threats and stuff, and he doesn't want that. Um, so he's like you know there's no professional upside for me. I got a stable job. I just lay low to one year, 18 months. I'm boom. I'm back to my job. Um, and I think what happens, I, so I think it's true. Uh, somebody said, well, he has a moral duty to do that. And I'm like, well, you know, we got to think about incentives, not just moral duties, because we can't expect people to always rise to moral duties. We need incentives. Um, one of the things it leads to is because he's quiet, that vacuum is filled by people who have nothing better to do and have nothing to lose. And so they start saying crazy stuff like the person we're both thinking of um, because the, the vacuum is there because this guy's not saying anything. And so I guess my and, – and, and then you come in and you write your stat piece, which honestly – if I were objective, I would say you have no professional interest to, I mean, besides the fact that you care passionately about it um, and you have some, you want to sleep at night, um, but you probably don't personally benefit in terms of your career for having written this. Um, and in fact, it, it puts yourself at risk to some degree, even though I believe it is a very heroic and important contribution. And someday historians will look back and say that this was a good, good thing that somebody wrote. So my question to you is, um, you know, one, do you agree with the premise that there are that we lack these incentives to get just middle of the road normal smart people to say stop what you're doing a little bit and speak up a little bit how do we incentivize these people to do it that's what i'm thinking about in my in my article and um and do you agree that you're taking professional risk and what makes you do it anyway yeah it's a great set of of questions um you know i think it's it has disturbed me to see how little reaction there has been to what I think of as sort of censorship, silencing, retraction. And to me, it seems like you have an obligation to stand up against those things, even when, or perhaps especially when you don't agree with the underlying article yes. that was censored or retracted, right? It's, it's sort of, it would be sort of silly if we only stood up for it when, when it was a thing that we agreed with, right? The, the sort of, I think, a bedrock principle of scholarship and academia and public policy is open debate and discourse and hearing out all sides in part because it leads to 
better and more useful policies because you understand the weaknesses in your own argument. Even yeah. if you don't switch your argument, the curiosity actually makes you better at it. And it, yeah, no, I, I it worries me that that we've seen several examples of kind of high profile, um, you know, whether it's you know the unit is the video is being removed from from YouTube, yeah, YouTube and the immediate reaction sort of goes to these little squabbles over well it's not really censorship because it's YouTube and, not, and right ar arguments that I wouldn't allow in a first year law school class because they're they're like they're not they're not the point they're sort of they sort of miss the point yeah you can call it whatever you want the point is right here's someone who a year ago is called you know the you know always on the list of one of the most important uh, you know, standard bearers of improving the quality of research who suddenly gone from that to shouldn't even be allowed to, you know, to have, to have video, his views yeah. on YouTube because, because right, everything on YouTube is such high quality. <laughs> um, and yeah, it really yeah. is remarkable to me that people don't see it, even if they disagree, or especially if they disagree as kind of that, that, that I, you know, I read some of the reactions when you or Jeff Fly or others, yeah. you know, said this is, you know, censorship is bad. How do we, need to, we really need to say this in 2020? And, and the sort of the range of, you know, there were the people who said, not only is it not bad, it's affirmatively good. And I am so glad YouTube is finally stepping up because, you know, clearly this is YouTube finally taking control yeah. of the, you know, the, this one random example is clearly <laughs> the problem that, yeah. that we had in our social media environment yeah. and now it's fixed. <laughs> um, but less, or maybe more worrisome to me than that was the the sort of blase reactions yes. from a lot of people. Yes. Like, this isn't my fight or this isn't my problem yes. or I don't really care about it or his videos aren't that important. And it seems to me that that we're at a problematic place yeah. as a, you know, academic community if if we don't all sort of feel invested in the idea that, people shouldn't be censured or censored for their ideas. They should be argued with. They should be, you, you know, the, I'm, I'm all in favor of calling out the, you know, the flaws in people's ideas, but that we've resorted to a, a you know, to playing at a level of, we didn't like the piece, so let's just get it retracted. Let's just get them, you know, let's make sure no one quotes them. I'm going to talk about this piece, but I'm not going to link to it because this piece is so dangerous yes. that no one yes. should get to read I it. I saw people say that. A, it's a disgraceful. Yeah, That's not anti-academic. Really <laughs> right. Unbelievable. Right. And I don't know how, you know, I don't totally understand. I mean, I think the interesting question to me and, you know, we, I don't think we can figure this out today, but I, I become very curious where these ideas come from because I believe the people saying them are really acting in, in, in good faith too. I mean, I think I have to be sort of both sides about this, right? I have to say they need to, to take someone like Ian Edison in, in good faith, but I also think and I need should to take, them take in good faith. So what I guess, they're doing in, in sort of saying, think, well, really, he should be censored. Take that in good faith. And I guess I, I see, you know, I think some of it is like bad incentives in the media. And some of it is, I think, the, the sort of Trump effect that, that, you know, Trump has turned, you know, makes yes. people feel polarized in a particular way. Trump and, derangement and syndrome. Improve, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Right. Yeah. But I think um, I've also been thinking a lot about, I don't know if you know that um, Naomi Oreskes, the book Merchants of Doubt, which is about the history of the tobacco industry. And, I haven't read um, it, but yeah, I've heard about it. Yeah. industry sort of, uh, you know, silencing or, or creating more dissent about the research yes. and the, um, the harms of cigarette smoke and the harms of, of global warming and trying to create doubt and trying to say, oh, look, there's lots of doubt when there's not. And I think it's a really important book and a great book, but I, I see a lot of people sort of explicitly or implicitly citing that here and i think we've learned kind of the wrong lesson from that i mean that that book is important and and you know everyone should sort of, sort of read it and, and use it to think about incentive problems in science and how science informs public policy but the lesson of that book is not that we need to like immediately foreclose all debate and label all opposing views instantly as sort of outside the mainstream and have a mainstream category and a non-mainstream category. And you know, part of what she rests her claim on is the fact that in both of those examples, we had decades and decades and decades of good research mm -hmm. that almost all pointed in a particular yeah. mm -hmm. direction. And yeah. so the, the field of uncertainty was getting more and more limited. And it seems to me, again, I, you know, I'm not a, this is not my field, but it seems to me unlikely that in any field of inquiry that really quickly, really early on in something novel, that the range of sort of acceptable opinions would rapidly narrow because you had such high certainty about every issue that you could immediately say all it's, of these views are non-conforming. Yes, yes. It just, it can't happen. It in can't months. happen. No. It can happen in decades, we but it cannot happen in six or nine months in most situations. It can't. And yeah. I mean, that seems to be the lesson we've learned from it. And I think that, that we need to figure out, you know, I think people feel very passionately that they're defending science and science is under threat. And 
I, I, I get that feeling and I'm, I'm sympathetic, right? Like I, yeah. I, we are doing this project because we believe in expertise in science, but I don't think this sort of reflective notion that we immediately need to cir- science is under attack. So let's circle the wagons and cut off people who aren't part of the the bandwagon. And, and as long <laughs> as they're sort of on the right side, we'll allow them. It's not particularly, it's certainly not particularly academic or scholarly, but I also don't think it's particularly helpful to the cause. And I think it's kind of a misreading of, of the lessons of something like Virgins of doubt, right? I don't think yes. unitis on COVID is the same thing as yes. big tobacco yes. on the that's research the, on tobacco. Yeah, and it's a very mistake. weird moral lesson that people have drawn very quickly. And you know, I don't know how to how to untangle that. But I part of what I'm interested in is sort of understanding in good faith why why people believe that not only are his views wrong, but he shouldn't even be Saying listened that. to or it's right. dangerous. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I agree with you. I mean, I think the video in question, the phrase he uttered that got everyone um, concerned was he said that when we finally get all is said and done, the infection fatality rate of SARS-CoV-2 will be in the, quote, same ballpark as seasonal flus. So, okay, that's a very vague phrase. You know, he's not talking about any one year seasonal flu. He's talking about seasonal flu. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. Same ballpark. How big is a ballpark? Is a ballpark point two, two and a, is a ballpark point two? Is it point three? Is it point four? Is it one percent? Is that a ballpark? So, you know, he it's, it's, it's a very, very murky phrase. And I don't want to, and, and who is censoring it? Um, a bunch of 30 year old employees for YouTube who have graduate degrees, but you know, have, um, but, ha- but happen to go work for the corporate company afterwards. Is that who you want making those calls? Um, I certainly don't. And is that really the most harmful thing on you? Yeah. And it, of course, YouTube's YouTube entire see, game see is about right, getting your, your, attention your attention for a long right, period of right. time. I mean, is that, is that video really the most harmful thing? If on, they, like, they should the censor one, their entire, the first and only thing we should ever remove. They should just video. remove their whole platform and give you your time back. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other example I thought was Facebook on the Carl Hennigan um, spectator piece where they said, this is quote false or like fake news, false. And because he said, quote, the Danish mask studies, quote, shows, quote, no significant effect of masks, which is technically true because it was non-significant, but it didn't exclude a smaller benefit, which I believe is fair to say. And, it's, you know, you could perfectly say that. But he didn't say anything incorrect within the sort of normal uses of language. Um, and then I saw somebody on Twitter, a very esteemed person with long, you know, 30 year history in this business saying, I read an article I dislike. I will not even cite that lest you go read that. That to me was sort of very concerning. And then I saw the same expert say on another occasion that don't trust someone because they're an Oxford professor. Trust them if they publish peer review articles on COVID, which could only be referring to Carl Hennigan, the only other fucking Oxford professor who's been talking about COVID. And he's not publishing peer review articles because his view is not a consensus view. So peer review will always make it harder to publish those articles in the short term. If he keeps plugging away, he'll get them out eventually, but it'll be, you know, 2022. Um, so it could only be about him. And I'm like, it's also credentialism and this put sanctifying peer review. Um, but in terms of why I think where this comes from is I would say, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I just finally read the book this, this, this year, The Coddling of the American Mind. And this is, um, you know, Lukanoff and, 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 and Jonathan Haidt's book, where they argue that there is a theme in modern universities um, to prevent, I think, certain types of discourse. And um, and they believe that it's attributable to a few things, which is that, you know, um, the kids in the university view the world as us and them, good guys, bad guys, very, very polarized view of the world. Um, they view that um, that um, they argue that feelings are facts or that if you feel personally offended by an idea, if it hurt, confronts you, that that's actually physical violence to you. And they say that that's actually a cognitive distortion and they draw upon cognitive behavioral theory to say that actually you need to separate. It's not actually hurting you. Um, and, and then the third one is the untruth of fragility. Uh, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Um, always trust your feelings in the battle of us versus them. Okay, so they wrote this book and, and, and I think their argument is that increasingly the academy, which is supposed to be a place where we're supposed to be debating ideas, is becoming more and more pushed towards conformity, towards keeping quiet and not talking about certain topics, t- 
topics. Um, and, and, they, and, and, and part of their view, the sub-theme of their view is that this is due to the new generation of kids coming on campus and their values and their upbringing and how they were raised as kids and these sorts of things. Um, I actually personally found that that second narrative to be the weaker part of the book um, because, you know, I'm, I'm not sure it has to do with how they're parented. I mean, I quibble about how they're parented when I see how they're parented. You know, like I think they are being coddled as children, um, but I'm not necessarily sure that's why they act this way as adults. Um, I don't know if they, I don't believe they, they proved that. I believe that they just angered me on two fronts. Um, they're coddling as a child and also the way they're acting in the university. But I think SARS-CoV-2 has shown us that it's not just the kids. It's not the kids. That was the mistake. The diagnosis was wrong. It is a societal fail. It is, it is, a, it is something that's spread beyond. And it's the idea that um, like in this, in this silencing John's video, everything in healthcare is a matter of life or death. That's easy. It's healthcare. It's life or death. So everything's life or death. And then the next thing is there's going to be some majority views, some minority views. So any minority view in a life or death issue is quote unquote harmful to people. So we've confused an idea with directly harming people, which is the same as I think they articulate confusing an idea that offends you from violence towards you. Okay. That's this cognitive distortion. And I think what this is showing, this whole event is showing, is that the that the I think they're right in their diagnosis that there are these cognitive distortions that have, for whatever reason, are prevalent in our society. But they're not just unique to kids. They they affect everybody from seventy year old academics at home who believe that John's article means that they will die of SARS CoV. They're more likely to die because of John in his fucking white suit. Uh, and they also, the same way that you know ch that kids, uh, not kids, but young adults who are in college. And not all of them, but a vocal minority of them who happen to be gaining a lot of traction. Uh, so I think it's it's the same. That's just my just my view of of like I, I think it's a it's a broader societal problem. Yeah, no, I think you're right, and I think I think the school. I mean, the the school's example I think is a perfect example of it. Where I think you know the the rhetoric that was used early on by people who are advocating for reopening some schools was all about, you know, how they were in denial, but also about how these ideas were, were dangerous and was dangerous to even talk about them. And they were endangering people and they were endangering children. There were going to be body bags of children. And once you use that kind of language, you, you make it impossible to have a discussion about something that right at a minimum, you ought to be able to say is a complicated issue that has multiple, yes. right. That as you've pointed out, needs yeah. to be informed by multiple Stakeholders, you know, areas yeah. of expertise, but also needs to be informed by a, a set of conversations about values and trade-offs when we're not going to be able to have one perfect policy. And there's a set of social, you know, policies embedded in our priorities about what we keep open and what we prioritize over other things. And that's a conversation everyone should have. And the idea that it was somehow, you know, dangerous or reckless to, reckless to even talk about it. You know, I think we've now seen the consequence of that, which is, you know, twofold. One, that, um, you know, that we have incredible polarization in, in where and which schools are closed, such that we, you know, have yeah. all the public schools in blue states <laughs> yes, closed, yes. but not private schools or public schools in red states, which yes. whatever you think about the issue, that can't be the right <laughs> it can't be the right thing, calculus, right? right? Yeah. It must yeah. have something to do with yeah. You know, the, the level of transmission, not that, but that's, yes. you know, that's where we come down to. And yeah. also that we've seen that the mainstream view, I hate using the word mainstream because, yes. you know, I don't even know what it means to call, but, yeah. but certainly more and more prominent voices are advocating for keeping schools open whenever possible who weren't before. Yes, they've come and around. I think that conversation both took longer to get to that point, but also a lot of people now can't hear it. And I, I sort of understand why they can't hear it. They've, they've become emotionally embroiled yes. in this issue because, and they've been told it's an issue of life or death and they They've had months and months of being told that. And now when someone says, oh, look, actually, maybe it's OK, they, they aren't able to hear that message because we started off with this incredible level of, you know, everything is certain. Every contrary idea is dangerous to make it any. There was, you know, an example of a, a prominent journalist who um, who told um they told Alistair Fair Monroe that it was yes, dangerous to even mention the comparison yes. between the IFR of the flu in children yes. and, and and the IFR of COVID. It was dangerous to yes. even have that idea I remember out that. there. That's that was and, scaring scary to me. The journalist right. is telling and, and, the guy who studies this <laughs> what he should have. And I think <laughs> even if you even if you disagree, even if you still believe that schools should more often than not be, yes, closed, be closed and sure. have a more pro I think it's very hard to defend the, the the structure of that debate and to defend the level of polarization and to defend the fact that it's politicized along red and blue lines and to defend the fact that there's no sort of let like the public school. I mean, it's the, the 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 difference between public schools and private schools. It's very hard to defend the way that conversation has 
unfolded. And I think it unfolded that way because we immediately resorted to term. You know, I think your analogy is right. We resorted to very emotional terminology about safety and danger and endangering lives and ideas being being dangerous. And we we therefore prevented a good faith discussion on both sides. And now and now I'm not sure we can have that discussion. I'm I think not, that, I, that moment has sailed and I don't know that we can actually have an intelligent discussion about it. I'm having discussions with people about um are we even going to reopen in September 2021? I mean, and um, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of parents sp- that climb up on the jungle gym structures and standing at the top of the slide to supervise their kids, of course, um, who are ner- who are who are, real- who are obviously nervous about sending. No, okay, that's the <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, okay, okay. Well, I got. I had to make that joke because if you, you know, that's that's a difference between a European attitude and American attitude. I don't see a lot of when I when I was in France, I never saw a lot of people climbing the jungle gyms. But here, I do sometimes biking by the park. I see see a lot of crazy things. Um, but the keeping schools open, I mean, I know how it's going to play out. Well, I have a guess. I'm willing to wager my guess here. I'm not always willing to wager my guess on all the policy issues, but on the schools, I know what's going to happen. I think it's a total fuck up. It's it's the worst decision of the whole pop the pandemic because um, the kids. Um, because we know from European experience that teachers who are attending in in-person schools, um, they they have a very, very tiny, slightly higher risk of contracting SARS-CoV-2, but it is not, you know, odds ratio 20. It was like odds ratio 1.5 to 2.5-ish, you know, which is within the realm of what a lot of us who go to work and, and do work do, and it's an essential job. And, and, and you know, I know two point, you know, those kinds of odds ratios may sound scary, but they're not that scary because the risk is still kind of low. And, and, and you could have had a system where maybe just the young teacher's go first preferentially um it would have been safer because the service they're providing is invaluable and they're one of the only ladders of upward mobility so we're going to keep seeing stories of you know all the kids who are physically abused while they were home sexually abused didn't have food um horrific stories are going to come out and it's going to be covered because that's a new type of fear uh porn that the media will cover and then, of course, as they grow up, it'll be the, quote, lost generation, the generation with fewer kids going to college, more, um, you know, struggles with depression and alcoholism and drugs. I would, I mean, these are what I suggest, what I suspect will happen based on all the prior studies. Um, and then I suspect that it will be a, a, an era of political turmoil that will come when these kids become a voting age. Who will they vote for? Who will seduce them? I think um, this was, I think, of all the things that John wrote in his article, the thing that people were most willing to overlook and not talk about was he talked about prolonged lockdown will lead to a bunch of things that he speculated. One was, of course, people will be fatigued. Um, and I think Julia Marcus has written very eloquently about that. But he even went to places that I certainly had not thought about in March, um, that it could be destabilizing for, um, that there could be rioting, there could be looting, there could be civil unrest, and that it could even be destabilizing for democracy. And, 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 and you know, at that time, you're like, well, that's, that's, that's crazy. Um, but of course, um, in 15, 20 years, when these kids come of age and we, they, they can easily be seduced by the new con man, a con man, uh, you know, we've seen some con man politicians, but imagine a con man who, who, who holds it together better, a con man who's more disciplined, who's less of a narcissist and more of a true believer. Um, you know, history has known such con men, eloquent speakers who are true believers and an eloquent speaker that's a true believer that finds some other to scapegoat and does it very effectively. That can, you, you, you can get 60% of the vote in this country just like that. I, I feel that you can get that vote. You can get a huge vote. You tell people the rich are the problems, the elites are the problems, uh, people who are uh, immigrating to this country are the problem. Um, you tell people that message that it's the other that's the problem, and, and you draw upon real hurt in them, and you've, you've not educated them, you failed them, and, and they have you know, all those sorts of sequelae of that. I mean, I think, I think we're in a bad place. And so, um, so I think it will be, you know, I, I even said, like, I think a whole departments will be studying the schools fiasco. And it's one of the few things that we've done, like the masks, no matter where you fall on that debate, it's going to be over soon someday. You know, we, I know that I read somebody said things we'll be wearing these forever, but I think that eventually we're not going to wear the mask. I'm willing to say that. Um, and, but we will be bearing the price of the schools fiasco. Um, and I actually want to say one last thing, and then I'll give you the last word. I think they did silence John. I mean, I think I think the silencing was twofold. One, people say that like, oh, well, you know, he's still talking. He keeps talking, and they can't stop him from talking, so he's not been silenced. But I think he's been notoriously co- quiet on schools, and I suspect he would, fr- I, I, from having read his body of work, I think he would be a strong supporter of schools reopening more urgently. Um, but I think he's been quiet on that because I think he's got his tail between his legs right now. He's been whipped a few many times in public. And I think everyone can take a few 
lashings, but I think he's had quite a lot. Um, and so he's he's quiet, I think. So I think he'd have silenced him to some degree. And I think there are a lot of people in the orbit of his intellectual views who are dead quiet. And they don't want to say a damn word. And they're just going to wait it out until you vaccinate enough people. And then they're going to come out um, because it, it sends a message to other people, just like dictators hanging somebody in the town square sends a message. Uh, it says, shut up. And only if you are a little bit deranged. Um, and, and I guess I just say my own personal motivation is... I guess somebody asked me recently because they messaged me and they said, you know, give it up. You're, you're fighting. You're beating a dead horse on schools. You're beating a dead horse on a number of these issues. Censorship. The, the crowd is not on your side. Um, you know, you're, you're 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 unlikely to persuade anybody. And I was like, well, I don't know. I, I guess I have this. Maybe it is a type of different cognitive deficit, a different uh, failure, which is that I, I will refuse to give it up because I was like, you know, I, I don't think the academy should be. I don't think that those of us who feel this way, that the academy is a place of debate, have to leave the academy and go create a new academy, just live in the world of podcasts. I will be I will be in the academy until you physically remove me from the academy. And as you're removing me, I'm going to be saying that I actually agree with I disagree with that person, but I believe they have the right to say what they have to say. Um, and then that you should argue with them or find a way to overcome their arguments. I will keep saying that um, at least as long as I believe it, because I think that this is the space that is worth fighting for. And um, and I appreciate you doing the same. So I'll give you the final words. I mean, any last thoughts on this issue? I mean, I thought your article was spectacular. I'm going to tweet it in a second. Well, thank you. No, I, I, I've agreed with everything you said. I mean, I think what you know, part of why, especially the last that, you know, part of why we wrote this piece was a desire to kind of give voice to a set of people who I think do hold good faith views that maybe are not on particular issues, you know, take schools, you know, are not necessarily in accord with what the, you know, the, the majority on Twitter believes and have felt unable to say that. And I think one of the rewarding, you know, two of the rewarding parts of the piece, one we heard from, you know, I think it got picked up by um, a lot of sort of center and center left voices it was not just sort of it it was not just taken up by people on the fringes or yeah. which was sort of not who we were writing yes. for you know i don't i don't need to silence them but we were not writing a defense of the fringe views we were writing a defense of people who really have good faith views and feel like when they articulate them they are unable to do it because people immediately make assumptions about their views or immediately label them in a particular way and it was rewarding to hear from from people and i hope you know we start to hear uh, you know, more voices and maybe it will become easier to do in a, in a Biden uh, administration. Yeah, but maybe. I guess more broadly, it just worries me that, you know, I think the long term effects of this are going to be hard to unravel both on, you know, the schools and the long term effects that will have. But also, I think, you know, the corroding public trust in expertise is a real problem. And I think um, we, I think we, meaning, you know, people who are in the sort of academic and, and journalist uh, circles are often kind of complicit either directly or indirectly in allowing sort of bad expertise or the misuse of expertise to crowd out sort of the genuine use of expertise, the kind of expertise that informs public debates, admits uncertainty, engages the other side, leaves room for other views, encourages public discussion of it, accepts that there are also public values and public policy issues at choice that are not just up to, you know, the experts. And I, I think every time we let that sort of get crowded out by the sort of, um, you know, bad or overconfident or overclaiming version of expertise, it corrodes the trust of the public. And I think the long term implications of how the public will will deal with that are not necessarily good. And we need to, you know, it's all of our problem. We all sort of need to find a way to kind of unravel that a little bit and stop just immediately circling the bandwagons in a way that's not, uh, you know, not actually helpful and not actually restoring uh, uh, confidence and trust in a sense that we're in an honest conversation between experts and the public. That's so well said. Everything you said, and they will have had less of an education to 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 participate in this in this situation. That's what makes it all this scary. Uh, Jacob Russell, thank you so much for doing this. This is a really I really enjoyed our discussion. Um, thank you, and I I wish more people. I wish more people saw saw what you see. I, I actually I suspect that since Twitter is a not a representative sample, I think a lot of people do see what you see, and they're waiting. Like my friend is waiting, and I don't blame him for waiting. He's making the right call. He's waiting for the moment. But one day there will be the moment when we have to speak up, <laughs> speak up. Um, otherwise, all the moments will be passed. But Jacob Russell, thank you so much. I really appreciate this discussion. You've been listening to season three of Plenary Session. Plenary Session is produced by Kiana Klosner. Music by Ian Straley and Audrey Tran. The views expressed on Plenary Session are those of whoever said it and no one else. 
Plenary Session is not medical advice. Follow us on Twitter at plenary underscore session. Until next time.